Actually, it looks pretty good. Okay. And this, this looks like the familiar room where you did your Twitch uh, broadcasts and so forth, right? So. Uh, yeah, I moved things around, but yeah, it's the same room. Okay. Great. Well, um, thanks for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and start just by saying that I, I've caught up now on Screeching Weasel events based on the February newsletter, and I read that you are now in songwriting mode, and so that's exciting yeah. to hear about, and I wanted to ask you about how that's been going and um, what you've been able to accomplish in that regard so far. Well, I, I mean, it's going fine. I, I've been able to accomplish, um, you know, a lot from, from my point of view, but I don't know uh, what the producer is going to think, and that's really um, what counts in the end. Uh, but I think I have, uh, I mean, you know, you always have stuff left over um, from other projects. And what happened this time was, I don't know how long it's been, but I had written all the music. I mean, some of it was bad and was going to have to be replaced, but I had written all the music for at two of baby fat mm -hmm. and for some reason when i was going through um the last couple times i've gone through my voluminous uh pile of of voice memos and and old demos and stuff to to see what i can poach from there and and that can be useful for some reason i didn't go through that stuff i think mm -hmm. it was just marked I was only going through the stuff that was marked demos and that stuff for some reason I had marked at two. So I went through that and I said, man, there's a lot of good stuff here. Um, I mean, some of it I used on the last album, but I was going from memory and you know, it killed me because probably about two weeks ago when I was doing that, maybe three weeks ago, I listened to the original um, voice memo for Bleed Through Me. This is one that I, I dreamed of the song and woke up in the middle of the night. It's like three or four in the morning and I came down here and, and belted it out, uh, just the chorus. And, uh, and I realized there was a way, way better melody on that vocal, on the voice memo. And say, somehow that didn't get translated. And I'm, now I'm kicking myself and wishing I hadn't recorded the song because it was just, I mean, it's basically the same thing, but there was just a little more to it uh, yeah. on the original one. And I don't know how that got lost. But anyway, so I've been going through um, some of that baby fat stuff. I haven't done too much with those yet, but I've got, I've got the best of them um, noted. And really some of the best of it is stuff that I'm not sure I'm gonna pursue this time because it's, it's a little darker Mm -hmm. And that's all I've been doing lately is the darker stuff. So okay. we've got a song that um, that has been kicking around for a few years now that I wanted to do on the last record and it didn't make the cut. There's one that's been that's gone back to the early 2000s that hasn't made the cut because the producer just wasn't happy with the uh, the bridge. Mm -hmm. And so I've rewritten that several times and I think I believe in the last conversation, if I recall correctly, he decided he was happy with it now by using basically two of the bridges, <laughs> like like the original one and the, and this additional one. And I think one of them is going to be like a lead guitar or an organ or something. Hmm. So I've been screwing around with that kind of stuff. I got a, I sent a voice memo for a thing I wrote last week, just a little verse I came up with. I sent that to Joe King from yeah. the Queers to see if he could come up with something because I w it wasn't really going anywhere, but it's a real, you know, one, four, five kind of mm -hmm. pop thing because I've been writing all this darker stuff musically and lyrically. I mean, there's only so many songs you can do about uh, insanity and, and, and the apocalypse and hell before mm -hmm. it starts to get a little tedious. So I'm trying to, to, you know, bring some more upbeat stuff in there, but it's, it's hard in the writing process because you don't you don't want to overthink that. Yeah. You want to throw the biggest pool of songs at at your bandmates and at the producer as you can. Um, and but you can't help thinking, you know, is this too 
far off from what I'm doing the majority of the time to belong on the album. Like there's a couple of just, you know, I guess kind of slight, they're good songs, but they're not, you know, they're just kind of, um, they're not heavy and dark. They're really, mm -hmm. really like light and kind of frivolous. Mm -hmm. which I think is a really good thing. I'm not knocking them, but I'm just saying in comparison to those songs, I don't know if they're going to really fit on the same record. Yeah. And yeah. I've thought about that a lot ever since going back to Wiggle, when I think we had a lot of songs, there was a schizophrenic kind of approach to, um, to the song selection on that record. It just, it, I don't think those songs worked well together at all. Mm. I mean, to me, it didn't make sense to have a song like, Jeannie's got a problem with her uterus, which is a good song mm -hmm. to have that on the same album as a song like it's all in my head. They're both good songs. I thought I still think they're good songs, but I don't know if they really belong on the same record uh, yeah. together. Yeah. So I don't want to make that mistake again, but then again, I don't want to overthink it. I'm supposed to be writing. So I'm just trying to spend, you know, spend time at this point, not really trying to write new stuff, trying to go with the old stuff, but I do sit down, you know, when you start doing this, you say, okay, I'm going to work on the old stuff, but then, you know, eventually you got the guitar in your hands and you start, you may be coming up with new tunes. Yeah. Or dreaming them, as you say, because sometimes that yeah. idea can just present itself. It's interesting. You, you bring up the conversations with the producer and, and bouncing ideas off of Joe, because that was one of my questions too, is, in your process, do you often share your voice memos and try to get the input from, from other people? And I know in interviews I've read with you from the past about kind of your learning from your mistakes or other uh, approaches to writing and putting out music. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned like you need to kind of figure out a point when uh, it's a, a better idea to be very selective and not just put out everything that comes into your head and not put out everything together in a big kind of mess of different concepts and ideas like as you were saying with wiggle and that, yeah. it's something that i've thought about a lot you know because composition of an album matters and themes of an album matter and that says something on its own besides you know the each individual song being catchy or good or fun or whatever you know feelings they evoke but yeah it, it's uh it's interesting to hear you talk about these things i know that you've, you've your uh relationship with mike kennedy and stuff is is seems like it's done a lot of good in terms of your perspective on producing your best work so that's pretty cool and thanks for sharing that stuff and besides uh besides joe are there other people that we might know about who are songwriters who you like to share stuff with or is it mainly just producer and joe and kind of keeping it in-house yeah. i mean not really and it's not it's not for any reason other than i find i think this is true of everyone too i find that i don't get a lot of valuable feedback Mm -hmm. from people I mean people would be like oh yeah that's good or whatever but I don't and it's kind of you know I've been um I've been for a few years now I don't know I guess it's been four or five years now I've been writing screenplays that are going nowhere but I found it's it's it, like getting somebody to read your screenplay is really hard and it's hard for everybody it like unless you're really really famous nobody wants to read a screenplay Mm -hmm. it's kind of a pain in the ass and I think it's a, a similar thing with songs it's like you can listen to something that somebody sends and say you know in its most rudimentary form which obviously is you know leaves you vulnerable that's not the best situation mm -hmm. but if you take that and you say well I'm sending it to somebody who who is either a songwriter or somebody who gets songs and so they you know they will know to make allowances for for the fact that it's pretty rough, um, but but you know most people, and I'm sure I would be the same way if people were sending stuff to me, where it's like you're probably not going to put a ton of effort into going like, okay, I think this is, you know, I think this works, or I think in this context, or with this group of songs, or whatever. So that's something that I find I really got to figure out for myself. Um, the thing I said to Joe was more that it was a thing that was really, really, really in Joe's wheelhouse because mm -hmm. he can come up with those those um, those three chord pop songs. You know, I mean, he comes up with those in his sleep. He's really yeah. good at that. That's yeah. um, 
probably his greatest strength as a songwriter. So, you know, can I do it? Yeah, but, um, but if, I can, if I can throw that at him and, and get something back that um, is, you know, something I wouldn't have come up with, that might be kind of cool. It's yeah. a funny thing though, because it's, um, you know, there's part of me that wants to do this record as, uh, you know, in a very, very deliberate way of saying, okay, even though I know this is a good song, I'm going to keep it off this record because I'm trying to go for something thematically here. Mm -hmm. And there's, I think there's a lot of value in, in having something consistent thematically. And I think it's, um, harder to do it and do reasonably well than than most people realize. Mm -hmm. When you think of bands that really were good at that, they're bands that um, may have been very popular, but maybe didn't get a lot of respect as as songwriters and as uh, performers as they should have. The Ramones is the obvious um, uh, example. You know, early Ramones, the first four albums or so. Um, ACDC, Motorhead, Black yeah. Sabbath. I mean, they're, they're bands that were, there was a common thread through everything. You know, even when Sabbath was doing records that, you know, there'd be like some oddball tune on there, like Laguna Sunrise or, or Cornucopia or something like that. It was, it, it still somehow thematically managed to work. And, um, and I think those bands, came across and still come across to some extent a certain amount of criticism for everything being too samey but um but i i grew up really valuing that in rock music and and uh and i think there's i think it can help you with your writing when you're really laser focused on a concept or a series of concepts that fit together so that's something that I struggled with with the last record because there isn't there isn't that consistent theme. Mm -hmm. There's those songs like "God Help Us" and uh, uh, "Dead by Dawn" and um, one or two others that that are darker, mm -hmm. that, that are more in line with what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. um, but there's not a whole album of them, and I I listen to it and I like the record, but I think it it's. Um, I, I mean, I remember saying at the time, I wish there was more of a consistent theme. I mean, it doesn't have to be a concept record, but just um, the, the kind of thing that you listen to and you feel like there's a beginning, middle and end yeah. to it, even though it's not, you know, obviously it's not going to be, it's not going to take place in a cohesive narrative like a film or a novel would, but, um, but but you do maybe have that sense, hopefully, of of um, there's something consistent tonally and writing wise and thematically with the lyrics, um, thematically even with the music, I guess. Um, so, and that's a tricky thing to do because how do you do that um, without, you know, by the beginning of side B, everything being way too repetitious? Right, right. So I don't know. I mean, at this point, it's just right, 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 right. Mm. And then, you know, as I'm writing and I'm demoing, I go, oh, shit. <laughs> I, I just used the same uh, intro that I used on the fucking song that I did last, you know, yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I got to change that. Because when you get into that, into that mode of songwriting, you repeat ideas. There are yeah. ideas that germinate in your brain. One thing that's changed a lot with me from the 90s is I lean into it, as they say now, um, rather than shy away from it. Um, but you still, you can't use the same intro. Mm -hmm. for two, yeah, right, right, for right. Two songs. You, so you can lean into things that, you know, like on Baby Fat, there, there's a, an intentional repeated chord progression that pops up over and over on the album and it's distinctive enough that if you're paying attention you're going to you're going to notice it yeah um and and that was uh you know in the songwriting process that was something that i had to watch like how, at what point does that become too much mm -hmm. at what at what point does your your kind of leitmotif uh in the wagnerian sense 
become obnoxious yeah. and overstay its welcome. So yeah. it, it, I find that that uh, it's more challenging to do things that way. Yeah, I'm perfectly capable of just writing a bunch of songs and and throwing them at the wall and seeing what sticks. And ultimately, that's what we'll do. But but I like the challenge of sitting down and saying, okay, I'm I'm kind of writing songs in a certain vein and and uh, and let's see how much I can squeeze out of this very limited um, idea. And that, I mean, that goes, you know, that goes back to, to the aesthetic that I pushed really hard, especially starting on uh, w with the Anthem for a New Tomorrow record, where I really was striving for something deliberately minimalist mm -hmm. and, um, and going with the idea that I'm going to try and get as much out of as possible, this small, this small amount of stuff. People listen to it and they they think, oh, that's easy. It's not easy. It's much harder to do than than to put everything but the kitchen sink into it. Right. You you've got to you've got to work harder. Yeah. Well, something that's always been very apparent in your journey as a songwriter is how much attention to detail and thoughtfulness you put into songwriting and, and you look for opportunities where I think a lot of people might either just be ignorant of those opportunities or not think that they're worth the challenge maybe, or maybe it just doesn't occur to them. Cause I just wrote down minimalist. I think, you know, a lot of the aesthetics in the pop punk world and the punk rock world, maybe at large, uh, have a very narrow minded view of how minimalism can be effective in songwriting. And it's just, Oh, okay, well, it's like a recipe. You got your four chords, a little minor chord here, and it's one minute, 30 seconds, and blah, blah, blah. There you go. But, but there, as you say, you're using a template still to communicate and to convey a message through the songwriting. And, and you, I think it's important, too, as a songwriter to challenge yourself to, and as you said, to squeeze every opportunity and every last drop out of that, that minimalist form. Uh, Baby Fat was really remarkable because it, it was, you know, very ambitious in, in its scope you know, and its concept and the, lyrically and I mean, so many ways. And I've, um, the most recent interview I read with you, you, you highlighted that as one of kind of your proudest moments. And, and I would agree. Um, and going forward, you were mentioning, you know, that you're in a kind of phase of your songwriting uh, career now where you're, you're trying to strive for excellence and not worry so much about the audience. And I think that what, what that makes me think of is, how complicated that relationship with the audience must be considering how limited a lot of listeners are in their capacity to understand why a song is good, for example, or why an album is good. Uh, and, you know, Baby Fat isn't often listed as like my favorite Screeching Weasel album, you know, because I think a lot of people just didn't get it, didn't, didn't understand that scope and appreciate the ambition and appreciate the, the effort that went into it. So what I'm saying, I guess, is it's cool to hear that you feel like you can do what you want to do. You can challenge yourself and still put out the records that you want to put out and not have to be so concerned about, you know, the other side of the, the coin, which is the business side of it and making sure that it gets, you know, gets the returns that you need just for your lifestyle and stuff like that. Because for us, I mean, a lot of us, we are passionate about songwriting. We love it, but, but I have a job that's not songwriting, you know? So it's, it's, right when those two worlds collide, I think it, 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 it makes me a lot more impressed with your vision of wanting to do things that way and to continue to, to push yourself. Well, you know, the, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why a lot of people don't like baby fat is be, it has nothing to do with the songs. I think the problem is people aren't paying attention to the songs. They're paying attention to who's singing them and yeah. they're kind of looking at it and going, um, well, there's a there's female voice on this, or there's black from the dwarves on that, and that's not what I expected. So I think, look, I mean, you've got to if you're if you're putting records out for public consumption, and it doesn't matter if you've even got an audience or not, or how big your audience is, that's irrelevant. But if you're putting it out there, you've got to keep your audience or your potential audience in mind to some extent, because otherwise you run the risk, I think, of being self-indulgent, which you know, granted, I think people, there are people who, who maybe thought baby fat was self-indulgent and maybe to some extent they're, they're right, but never without a, um, never without an eye to doing what I thought was very crowd-pleasing uh, music. And 
of course it was challenging for me because I, I had never had to write in sequence. But I mean, it's almost like the, the record making equivalent of going and making a big, a huge Hollywood film and filming the whole thing in sequence, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, nobody would ever do that. It's completely insane. Yeah. And this, the same with this, like you've got to say, this thing is happening in the narrative at this point. So the music here has to, first of all, the lyrics have to move the, the story forward and the music has to fit that tonally. Mm -hmm. So you not only have to have a good song there, but you have to have a really specific kind of good song. And, um, and I enjoyed the challenge of that. And it was very, very challenging. I spent, you know, quite a long time working on that. And there were a lot, probably a lot more misses than hits <laughs> in, in what I was trying to do. But, um, but I, I do keep the audience in mind, I guess, uh, you know, the way I look at it, though, is that when you've been around for a while, and you have an audience, and especially when it's an audience who you know, looks at a particular era of the band mm -hmm. as as the apogee of the band. Like it's one thing to go out and play shows, and you know what people want to hear. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't take a lot to figure that out. And so when we go do that, I put the songs in the set list that people want to hear, even if it's maybe one that I'm not that excited about seeing. Right. You know, the paying customers want to hear it, and I'm fine with that. But when I'm making records, it's a little bit different because people think they know what they want to hear, but they don't. When it, when it comes to new songs, you've got people who will say, who will basically take the attitude, like, why can't they make records like they did in the 90s? Mm -hmm. And those same people, if you went and tried to copy what you did in the 90s, would say, well, they're just copying themselves. So there's a, there's, and I mean, I'm not putting anybody down by singing this. I'm, I'm just saying there's, they don't really know what they want. So mm -hmm. it's your job when you're making a new record to tell them what they want. And maybe you'll succeed and maybe you won't, but, but it's your job to, to put out there where you're at writing wise, yeah. um, doing the absolute best that you can putting, I mean, this is assuming you're putting a lot of effort into it. You haven't gotten lazy. Mm -hmm. You're not, you know, just trying to cash in or whatever. You're actually, you actually care about songs. And if you care about songs and songwriting and, and doing the work that it requires and um, giving the songs the attention that they require, um, then you're really saying to them, this is where I'm at now because a band is not, nor should it be a stagnant thing. Right. And as much as I love those early Black Sabbath records, I wouldn't want to be without, um, I wouldn't want to be without, even like Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, which is pretty different in some ways from what came before with them. And I wouldn't want to be out without necessarily um, the Ronnie Dio stuff as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's pretty radically different from what they had done before, but it's, it, I'm glad that it exists and I can hear it. I may yeah. not be as crazy about it as I am about the earlier stuff, but that, to me sounds like a band that's not just going through the motions. Right. Like, yeah, it's different, but it, that's where they were at at that point. And I think it's, I think it's, those are legitimate quality efforts. And there's some very, very good songs on them as well. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, I grew up on, on, you know, seventies rock basically. Mm -hmm. And I think <clears throat> your earliest influences probably you can't get rid of them, yeah. but that was, uh, I was always interested in making albums yeah. and, and, um, and the idea was you would make something that people would buy it and sit down and listen to it from beginning to end multiple times. And you're kind of creating a little world for people to immerse themselves in. And obviously that's very difficult to do these days when we, everything is kind of ephemeral and oh, yeah. people don't really give things very much attention, but I don't think that's a good enough reason to stop doing it. Like, I, I, I think the idea is still good in the same way that I always thought it was a good idea when, when vinyl went away and it was all CDs. I still thought it was a good idea to sequence a CD mm -hmm. as you would a vinyl record, where yeah. here's my last song on 
side A and here's my first song on side B, even though, even though there was no side A or B. Okay. It was still a pretty sound way to sequence an album. Mm -hmm. um, so it, to, in the same way, I think um, it's still a good idea to think in terms of albums. Mm -hmm. and, and so the whole process kind of goes step by step from song to, to album in a way that, um, you know, there, there can be a lot of different factors involved in it, but I think the best way to do it is to look at it um, in steps rather mm -hmm. than overwhelm yourself by saying, okay, as a lot of bands do, and as I know I did before we made Wiggle, where you say, okay, I had a successful record and, and now I've got to follow it up and you mm -hmm. kind of panic and freak out much easier to break everything down to the steps and kind of take it as it comes. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe how it ends up isn't the way you originally envisioned it. But then I think that's true with a lot of songs too. You start out with an idea, maybe even you start out with a line, a lyric that, or a title that motivates the idea. And by the time you finish the song, the lyric's gone. You've, you've cut it out because yeah. it went in a different direction. And I think that's that's part of the process. So I, I, I think actually putting together the whole project works in much the same way. And to try to have an idea of what you want to do is great. To try to um, control it too much maybe isn't the best idea. Well, that's just, that is, there's a lot of valuable insight there. And I agree. I think the, the format of the album, I kind of look at it almost as a as a motif or a genre, almost like a, like literature or film, you know, you have it packaged in a certain format that's uh, digestible and it, it gives you a lot of room to be creative, but you're still progressing the story in a certain way. Um, so that's, that's really cool to hear. Um, so with some of the notes I wrote down while you were talking, it had to do with um, change and progression and, and people's comfort level with all that stuff. And you know, we, the, the punk world, is awash in nostalgia, which is a very powerful force. And I think it can be limiting for people who create punk rock music too, because there's, there's always instant comfort in what's familiar and what's uh, tried and true. But one thing I, try, I think about a lot as, as uh, someone who wants to make good songs is allowing the weirdness to come into play and, and allowing yourself to be, you know, creative on a level that breaks free from the, the familiar tropes. And I think something you've done very well, you know, and your example throughout your career is, is like expanding vistas, whether lyrically or, you know, in terms of concepts or in terms of how a punk so song can be presented. And you've done it in many different ways, uh, you know, uh, the way you've recorded albums, uh, the way you've, um, I don't know. And at every step you've been, you've been chugging along and you, you've maintained uh, output that is inspiring because I think being prolific and, and, seeing it as a form of labor and, and being able to get results based on your ideas and follow through with it is very important too. So um, there's a, a quote from a guy, I don't know if you're familiar with the band, the Mountain Goats, uh, John Darnell is a pretty excellent songwriter. I've heard of them, yes. I don't know if I've ever heard their music, but I know who they are. It's very, it's very uh, his lyrics are very literary, literary in, in their scope and, and his language is really impressive. He's a novelist as well, so he kind of brings in that flavor. But he, he was interviewed on Fresh Air or something like that. And he said, you know, songwriting is, at the end of the day, a labor. You can sit down and decide that you're going to write a song and you can make it happen. And he, does, right. he kind of applies that uh, logic to his work. But I think what you said is, is very important, too, about not, not trying to assume too much level of control in the process and allow things to happen that will occur naturally. Because kind of the magic of the creativity is, is those things that are unexpected. I mean, dreaming the song. It's not yeah. something you would have planned. Uh, and then sometimes life contexts and experiences that you have will, will inform that whole experience too. Well, I think, um, I, I mean, I did, if you, if you uh, asked me, what is my opinion? Is it more, you know, if I had to, if I couldn't have any nuance whatsoever and say, is it more, is it more, um, you know, a craft, or is it more of a of a kind of inspiration kind of thing? I would not hesitate to say craft mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the I sent out a newsletter earlier today talking about this kind of stuff, and I said in it, I, "Divine inspiration is maybe five percent mm -hmm. of the process, and and sometimes it's barely even that." Um, and you can, I mean, there were, you know, some of the best songwriters of all time sat down at a desk every day, mm -hmm. you know, in the Brill Building or wherever 
and okay, I need to write a song and it needs to be this kind of song. And, and, and those are some of the greatest songs ever written. Uh, so you can do that. Of course, there is, um, there is always, I think, some element of the transcendent in there yeah. because you, I don't think you can have a truly great song without that. But, but I think anybody who, who writes also knows that you can't force that. I think right. part of the reason why novelists and, and songwriters and screenwriters um, get into heavy drinking and, and drugs is because they're trying to, <clears throat> they're trying to force that issue. They're trying to create a state of transcendence from which they can then write. And, and you can't really do that. You can kind of sort of do it artificially a little bit for, for a brief time, but nobody I think has ever um, managed to continue doing that. I think, I think very quickly the negatives begin to outweigh the positives and it negatively affects your work. So I think, you know, from, from my perspective, I don't dwell on it too much. Mm -hmm. um, the transcendent part of it, because it just is at this point and has been for a long time. It just is this thing that's there. Um, but the craft part of it is important to focus on for me because it reminds me that it's a very bad idea to do what I think a lot of songwriters do. Certainly a lot of the ones I've known in the past, which is they just don't work unless inspiration strikes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think that's a good way to approach it. You know, there is, there is that thing of sitting down and I do it frequently sitting down and strumming a chord and seeing if anything comes out of that. And maybe a melody comes up and you decide then where that chord is going to go from there. Mm -hmm. um, I've written some really great stuff that way. And it's a gift. It's a blessing when a song comes to you in a dream, as has yeah. happened to me before. But it doesn't happen very often. And it's not a smart idea to count on that. Right. So I kind of take the, I, I kind of take the Jacques Maritain um, uh, idea about art, which I imagine he got uh, largely from Aquinas. That, that views it as a craft, mm -hmm. somewhat similar to, you know, something you might do working with your hands, building things, carpentry or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. because, uh, because then you can, those are things that you can control with your effort. You True. know, you can't control the transcendent, but you can control, um, I'm going to sit down and try this today. You know, one of the suggestions I made in my newsletter, you know, kind of answering the question, if I have advice for young songwriters, and one of the answers I had was experiment with things like, um, I'm gonna try and write a great bridge and write a song around that bridge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna try to write a great tag and write a song around that, or I'm gonna write a song without a chorus. Or this. So there are things that, you can do and you may not ever finish that project but generally speaking i find that i get some good ideas out of it yeah. um the, the, but the more you know your craft the more you do it the more comfortable you become with um with the idea that a lot of quite a lot of the results that you get are through your efforts and your work mm -hmm. rather than this magical thing that you hope will come along. And if it doesn't, everybody's going to find out you're a fraud right, right. and, and so forth. So um, I think that's where a lot of songwriters run into trouble, whether they sure. want to admit it or not. I think a lot of them feel fraudulent. And I certainly did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but the antidote to that, I think is just, just to work yeah. and, and yeah. work without a particular end in sight necessarily, especially now when you don't really have to put out records the way right. we used to have to. Um, don't worry if you go sit down and work for an hour and don't get anything usable out of it. Right. But, but just getting into the process of doing that, you're going to learn things and you're going to become better at your craft the mm -hmm. more time you put into it. And th that will, um, that will result in dividends, if not immediately down the road. Yeah, uh, that's great. There's a comfort in the discipline too. I mean, if you compare it to physical exercise or something, if you're well conditioned and you're used to the rigor and the stress that you put on your body to do push-ups and sit-ups and jumping jacks, then when you do it, 
it becomes more comfortable and you, it becomes more of an enjoyable task in itself. And I think that that's a great um, outcome from doing the work, you know, just to do the work, feeling your hands on the guitar, pressing the record button, doing all the little logistical things to make it happen and, and being comfortable with that routine. Then the good things that come from it, from the experience and the reflection and, and challenging yourself to not repeat yourself too often or to, you know, get bogged down in other distractions. I think there's, there's a lot to be said for, for that um, approach. And then in regards to the transcendent, you know, it's something that people who are creative have uh, apparently is kind of a more sensitive sensitivity to these sources of inspiration maybe, or maybe it's just a sensitivity to life. I find that a lot of my friends who are creative and, and certainly myself uh, have struggled with depression, struggled with challenges in life, social challenges, things that, that can really interfere and bother me a lot in my daily life. And I think of maybe it was Bruce Springsteen was quoted in an interview saying that take a man who is constantly bothered by things and you, you can make a great songwriter out of that person. And uh, I think that that's yeah. kind of the gift of being a songwriter is having the access, but of course it comes at a price. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you pay, you pay a price for creative work, mm -hmm. any kind of creative work. And the, and the challenge is am I going am I going to be able to um, to do my work and do great work without a becoming you know shortening my life becoming an addict or yeah. something yeah um, but also realizing that your work will not heal you right. that's not what it's for it's for other people and I think this is where this is where the audience comes in ultimately you um the music isn't really for you right the novel or the film or whatever isn't really for you and i think one of the one of my favorite subjects lately i find it fascinating was i started i just kind of was interested in the french revolution so i started reading about it studying it just a period of time i didn't know much about and as i got into that of course i began learning more about the enlightenment in general which is one of those things that i you know i always kind of taken it for granted the the enlightenment was a was a totally great thing a massive uh, uh massively important turning point in history where uh the dark ages went away and everything started getting better which <laughs> obviously you study it for a little bit and you realize that's it, the kindest thing you can say about that view is that it's a simplification i think it's actually largely wrong uh now but one of the things I, I came across in studying that was um, a realization, and also from listening to a lot of opera, mm -hmm. um, in the especially romantic period opera, was the realization that um, that the the kind of post enlightenment romantic mindset was a was a much more radical shift than I had realized from from what had come before in terms of um the importance it placed on the individual's inner life mm. i guess you could say and you can trace that and i i mean i'm about as far from an expert as you can get but just based on things i've read and listened to you can kind of trace that throughout you know from the the you know late 18th century um you can trace that to the present day mm. you know through the early part of the 20th century with expressionism and and uh, Freudian psychology, particularly uh, to, so that we're at a point now where um, songwriting, for instance, is thought to be an intensely personal endeavor that's all about self-expression. Right, right. And certainly that was my point of view for for a while there when mm -hmm. I was starting out. Um, because that is society's view of it. I think quite a lot of um, of what you know, very popular music right now, pop music, is focused on the intensely personal. Mm -hmm. And um, and I I have as as I've learned more about this, I've become more adamant about rejecting that in my own in my own stuff. Because I saw certainly I saw it with Baby Fat. But even before then, going back to going back probably at least 15, 16 years, 
I made a conscious decision, and this was obviously before I had, you know, dived into my uh, enlightenment studies. Uh, but I had made a conscious decision to move to the fictional uh, away from the personal mm -hmm. and uh, mainly to see what would happen, to see yeah. how it would work. And it worked much better than I had expected. And of course, the, you know, the thing that everybody learns when they do that is that you end up telling much more effective truths through fiction than you do through confessional or autobiographical um, yeah stuff but the important point to me is is um is that it is not i'm not doing this for i'm not doing songs as therapy yeah i'm not doing songs to heal myself i'm i'm doing it because first of all i'm driven to do it but i'm it, it's ultimately you know my friend heather joe king's uh sister is a writer and she put it really well she said writing for her is an act of love even though you know, she's a terrific introvert and uh, and can't spend a lot of time around other people, which I understand very well. Um, that's her way of connecting with with other people. And it's it's a gift of herself or whatever her gifts and talents are to other people. And I think there's a lot of validity to that. It's not something you do for your own edification. It's not something to do to figure out your place in the world or or mm. to make yourself better or to fix yourself. That's not how it works. And that's not how it's supposed to work. It is a thing that you do for other people. It's a really a, ultimately a method of communication and communication in the, in the real sense of, um, of, a, of, of a conversation of sorts, of your side of the conversation um, or your interpretation of, uh, of the world and how it works. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, uh, of course the best stuff is how it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> but, but that all speaks, I think, to, uh, to people in a way that defies analysis yeah. and yeah. it's supposed to. Yeah. And, and if you're, if you're doing your job right, um, I don't think it's going to bring healing to your life. You're still going to be the, the very messed up individual that, that you were. In fact, the, the kind of messed up individual that maybe is more inclined to do creative work. Mm -hmm. um, but you're doing, I think, what you should be doing. You're kind of reaching out to other people with your stuff. And, you know, sure, a lot of people are not going to understand it or they'll read it wrong or, or whatever it is. But that's why we don't just do lyrics. That's why yeah. we're not poets. That's why we marry the lyrics to the music to give, you know, almost give little cues about what's what's being said here. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, hopefully I'm accomplishing that. That's certainly what I'm focused on now. I'm not, I don't want to um, unburden myself through my, through my songs. And of course, just as you find that you, you, um, that you kind of uncover larger truths through fiction, I think you also find that Oh, there is a lot more of myself in this than I realized. When I stopped forcing the issue, um, a lot more of my worldview actually came through. That's inevitable and it's unavoidable and you shouldn't try to avoid it. Yeah. But this idea of sitting down and kind of using, using your songs as a personal diary, it's, there are very, very, very few people who can do that really well. That's much harder to do. Everybody does it because they think it's the easiest thing to do. Well, I know myself and I know my... I know what's in my head, but what's in your head isn't that unique or, or interesting, really, when it comes to your feelings or your, or your situation in life or whatever. Um, it's your ability to express that well, which I think can only be done by getting out of your own head and focusing on the universal. Fiction isn't the only way to do that, but it's a very effective way. Yeah, uh, very well said. Uh, in the notes I was taking, I wrote down and underlined universality, and I think yeah. something that, that you've inspired me to do is knowing that you're you're a thoughtful person and you seek out experience and, and knowledge through reading and through uh, observation and, and consideration and reflection, and all of those things for me have reduced the ego in my songwriting and have challenged me to strive more towards the universal and to appreciate the value of that and, and understand that the listeners may be limited in how they can receive it. Because I think 
even, you know, as songwriters are prone to write in an egotistical way, listeners are prone to assume that everything is autobiographical, uh, autobiographical mm -hmm. and literal. But yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, with what you said. And it, it's very, uh, you know, it, you can't it, do anything about that, though. I mean, I and I always <laughs> say you 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 know, once something's down on a record, it's there. It's like a permanent record, right? So yeah. you better aim high. Yeah. Because, because if you aim low, yeah, lots of people will will get where you're coming from, but you're gonna you're not gonna feel too good about that right. in a year or two, let alone twenty years. Um, so you know, I mean it's not an excuse to be pretentious or pompous or anything, but, you know, challenge yourself, challenge your listeners to some extent. If they don't know, you know, if you throw some reference in there and they don't know what you're talking about, I mean, it's pretty easy to Google yeah. things these days. So, yeah. you know, ultimately, if you're not doing it just to show off, if you're doing it because there's this connection here between this or that and this other thing, that I'm doing, which there should be, if you've if you've paid attention at all to to great art uh, in your life, then you know that this stuff has all been done before. Yes. So it's all kind of there. And when you're throwing these references into things, um, there there can be a variety of different reasons for doing it, but they're all strategic. And yes. um, and I don't think you should you should you know, you don't want to get out there and write some of the like, you know, some of the, like those seventies rush lyrics where they were just really pretentious, yeah. but, um, but you don't want to dumb things down either. Well, and that can be a very big temptation for people in my little world of pop punk, because that's a familiar trope and it's a standard and it's an aesthetic that people relate to. They're like, let's write about hamburgers and bubble gum and flying yeah, sauce. But you know something, like that, right? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with writing about hamburgers and bubble gum. But it, again, it's one of those things to do it effectively. You're not Didi Ramon, most of yeah. these guys, you yeah. know, like to do it effectively is much harder than people think. And, and uh, they'd be better served, you know, do, doing something else because to do something, you know, all that stuff, when it works, it's deceptively simple. Oh, yeah. It looks easy. And that's what great artists do they make it look easy um mm -hmm. but but it's much harder and i think part of the problem too with with genre music not just pop punk but any genre music is that most of the people the overwhelming majority of the people who you know make music in the in any given genre are the highest they're aiming for is i i want to go over with people who are into this genre and that's not very high yeah. And, and, and so, um, and so they're not even, if you're not even aiming very high to begin with, yeah. I, I don't know how easy it is to do something that transcends the norms of the genre while still appealing to the people who are into it. Mm -hmm. um, for me, for all my anxieties and worries over the past 30, I don't know how long it is now, 35 years, I think, um, the one thing I never worried about or stressed about was if I was um, doing stuff that fit in the genre of pop punk. I mean, I, you know, to me, it was for maybe a year, year and a half, it was really cool because it was this thing that virtually nobody was doing and the bands that, that were doing it were almost universally really good because there were only a handful of them. There was yeah. us, there was the the queers. If you wanted to throw Green Day in there, Mr. T experience, there just weren't very many. And then as it gained in popularity, even before Green Day became really popular, as it gained in popularity really quickly, it was just, it was an embarrassing genre to be considered a part of. Yeah, I, I don't think it's any different in that extent than, you know, power metal or yeah. or, you know, bluegrass or whatever it might be but um but uh, the people who weren't around at the time in the early 90s uh that kind of think of that as golden age of pop punk maybe don't realize that most of what was being done in the genre was quite bad mm -hmm. uh and and you can when you look at the bands that succeeded then that you still know about now 
um, that was pretty much it. And I mean, pretty much everything else that didn't succeed with very few exceptions didn't succeed because it didn't deserve to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and now obviously it's, you know, you got people who are really into the genre and I just, those aren't my people. I don't write for those people. I don't, if they like my stuff, that's fine. But I don't do anything to try to appeal to them because when I look at the stuff that they like, it's stuff that, that I don't aspire to in the slightest. I mean, to me, it, 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 it really is like just, you know, throw us three chords and a song about a chick or yeah. chewing bubble gum or whatever, and they're going to, and they're going to go for it. And, uh, and I, they just don't seem to have discerning taste. They don't seem to be really interested in or even recognize when stuff transcends the genre. I mean, if you really believe that there's no fundamental difference between the Mr. T experience and, and like a hundred generic pop punk bands, then, then you don't, to me, you don't get it. And it would be dangerous to try to, to try to appeal to you. It is great that you like the Mr. T experience, but if you don't see them as almost the apogee or the, the height of the, the genre, um, I don't know what to tell you. I don't think I can explain it to you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I don't get that at all. Well, it would, be, it would be like to me saying that Black Sabbath was fundamentally the same as like, you know, all the, all the, you know, really cheese ball kind of doom metal, dope metal bands that yeah. followed in their wake in the, in the nineties, in the two thousands. I mean, right. it's not to me, there's like maybe one or two of those that are really good, but, but for the most part, there's no comparison. I, I think you said it very well. Well, um, I have to go teach a seventh grade. Yeah, I got to go get uh, my pizza dough started. Yeah. Oh, you're oh, making homemade? Homemade pizza is a, a weekly tradition here as well. So good. Oh, really? Yeah, good. I've been doing I wasn't doing it, but my son, my son, he's the only nine-year-old kid in the world. He won't eat frozen pizza anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's like, nah. I, he doesn't complain. He just says, nah, I don't <laughs> like it. I'll eat something else. Okay. Homemade dough does the trick, I bet. Yeah, yeah my, my I mean, son's a little picky as well. He's he's about five years old and the same attitude towards the frozen pizza. So, you know, I I'm fine with it, but it's not that hard to make the the fresh stuff. I mean, it doesn't yeah. take that much time. I do I do a sauce about every six weeks, and I make a big batch and freeze most of it. There you go. And then uh, and then making the dough doesn't <clears throat> doesn't really take that long, and and uh, you know I'll saute some onion and pepper and yeah. I'm done. It's so. it, it style. Well, hey, um, enjoy it. I really enjoyed this conversation. I want to th thank you for yeah, it. Me too. Thank it, you. It meant a lot to me. And, um, you know, our paths may cross again at some point. But until then, Certainly. thank you. And uh, I'll just save the video and I'll edit the, you know, beginning uh, part out and keep the rest if that's cool. Yep. Sounds good to me. All right. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, onwards and upwards. Okay. Have a good thank week. You. Yep. So long. Okay. Bye.